I do love a good tofuri in the morning. It's better than a cappuccino, but not quite as good as a pot of tea. But enough about all that life enriching stuff. Why don't you come inside and have a look at all the pots? Everything here is a reaction to something. So here even my house number. I've used glass and ceramic to create my 35. It's a reaction to the fact that if any brass numbers get stolen in this area. They come in the night and they unscrew them and then they melt them down for scrap. And uh, I thought, if I can't have my brass, I may as well use my glass. A deeper thought. Let's go and see the real magic, though. I'm sure you can't wait. Come into my house and have a look. I start my day, I wake up, and I kind of luxuriate in front of my inspiration. You know, a coconut shell that I got in India. Alex Hamilton's uh, latest uh, stencils. I love Chinese items. This is a piece that I made. The original is double the size. And uh, it shrinks 50% in the kiln. Fantastic. Here we have my name, John Bauer. I found a typewriter in the canal. And, and it was completely rusted and, and weathered, and I pulled off my name. I thought, no one will ever type my name on this typewriter again. I may as well keep it. Um, and then, I mean, look at this, this beautiful, these, these old, this is an oil pot. And you can buy these things on Milton Market. They're from like 1890. And it's just so inspiring. This was thrown away, went into a landfill, and comes out of the landfill. Perfect. And, wow, here is a, like a saturation area of a project that I'm really excited about. And it's, it's preserving lace, it's preserving dolls, doilies, and it puts them all together in, in like an easy, manageable, contextualized package. Inspiration is so important because you need to look at what you've achieved to realize what you're capable of. Because when you're functioning on a very, very high level, it's like you almost forget your own achievements if you don't keep them nearby. And your own stuff uh, can inspire you as well as other objects as well. Um, I kind of, after this, move on and do a little bit of glaze work and painting and it's really... It's just such a fluid way of, uh, of working. I suppose, uh, forgive the pun, because it is working with fluids, but um, this is where I come in the morning. It's my first stop. It's got very beautiful light in the morning. A glaze is a wonderful thing to work with in the morning because of its fluidity. If you think about it, you're stirring a glaze. It's very similar to Tai Chi. It's very soft. It's gentle. You're not putting a lot of force on your body. You aren't abusing yourself at 5.30 in the morning. You are easing into the day. And I'll also have set up here work that's waiting to be photographed. You have to have all your pieces photographed so that you can reflect on them long after they have been sold. And you can often learn things 10 years later from a piece that you didn't learn at the time. Um, the critical thing as an artist is understanding the critical voice in your head. And as you re-expose yourself to what you have done again and again and again, your critical voice develops a maturity like a wine and your way of inter interpreting what you are busy with becomes much more mellowed, a little bit woody. This piece here I'm absolutely loving. The blue is so vivid, in fact look it almost vanishes on my jacket. I mean that is like, love the blue, absolutely. And, and this 
inspires me, you know, I'm working and when you put this glaze on, uh, a piece glazed with this is grey until you fire it, so there's like this magic that comes through. Light is critical. When, when you're working, you need to be surrounded with light, you need to be on a very high vibration. You're creating luxury objects, so you must be living a luxurious moment while you are creating that. You cannot, you know, create these beautiful items when you're in terrible pain. The heat in this room, it's a very hot room, and that's why I use it, because I leave the pots on the shelves here, the heat drives the moisture off, so I don't have to burn the moisture off in the kiln. And that enables me to uh, save a lot of electricity, which is much better for the environment. From here, this stuff would go to the kiln, but I wouldn't do it at this stage, because it's morning, it's early, I've been working with the fluid. Next, I'm going to work with the plastic clay that one can mold. So I'm going slowly up the scales of hardnesses. Why don't you come and learn how to make a pinch pot? So I'm passing through, this is essentially the center point of the house. No windows, it's a very secure room, it's very held. And this is where I keep my very, very special pieces, the most inspirational work that I've done. And, um, yeah, I, I glance at them as I go through, and I truly hope every morning as I pass by that I'd be able to make a piece that is worthy of putting on that shelf today. This here is my studio. If you want to be the greatest potter in the whole world, you need, as I have here in this room, over 100 square meters of shelving. Shelving is what makes you great. I like that, that's like... It makes you great, shelving. So, as I come through, I sit down in my chair. Now, executives always have their ergonomic this and that, and gel this and that, office chairs. This is my chair, as you can see. It's cannibalized from the paraplegic sector of society. You do get no greater ergonomically designed chair than a medical chair. So, I zoom around, I can get far higher speeds than an office chair. And when you're performing on a very high level, you need to be speedy. This is a ball of porcelain. You've got the ball, and you now channel all your happy memories. So you need to be in a space of tranquility. And I'm not talking about the sort of hippie tranquility of I'm doing nothing. It's a tranquility with action. You take your ball, resting in your hand. You always establish the base first, because if you're working on a bigger piece, and you establish the rim, you only have the length of your thumb. That's your limiting factor. So if you do a beautiful rim, you can't get into the base. So it's critical to establish your base early on in your making of your pinch pot. Your base is completely finished, and then you start working on the walls. I've now established my base. I know that this base is four millimeters thick because that's my experience. You can slice your pot in half and check, but I'm not that kind of potter. I believe that if you practice, everybody is actually quite smart and they'll get it right without having to slice their pots in half. I'm working on the walls here, and what I'm doing is I'm using this bit here of my thumb and that is the, the most powerful driving force because you've got the angle straight from the bone into the joint. Some people don't have bendy backy thumbs. That's just because you haven't made enough pinch pots yet. It will happen. Keep going.
if your thumb is straight like that, you still might want to start applying pressure on the tip of the thumb. But as soon as you graduate and get your bendy backy thumb, it gets a lot easier. What I'm doing here, porcelain is very short and uh, because of the outward force of my pinching it's formed tiny little facet cracks on the surface and it's very important to pull those cracks not close them you pull the one crack right over the other it's like people who don't have any teeth and they can take their bottom lip and put it over their nose that's what you're doing here you have to work quickly I know it looks like I'm doing this quickly I'm doing this slowly because you need to be able to follow it but you you must work as quickly as you can you can see that I'm not I'm not stressing the rim. It's always remaining round. The area that I'm working on, it's a very localized pressure. The localized pressure means that my force is only affecting the area of the pot that I'm touching. The rest of the pot isn't jumping around. I'm absolutely static. And I'm working on that part. I'm only affecting that part. So I'm just using my finger, my thumb, while supporting it and I'm actually just smearing and I'm, I'm increasing the volume of this bowl and it happens slowly so if you don't know what's going on sometimes you'll miss it but this bowl is, is now being inflated like a soap bubble and it's getting more and more bountiful. That would make a wonderful, wonderful creme brulee. You may want to take up the art of creme brulee, brulee making when you make pinch pots. So that is about as far as I would go with a pot. Um, and that's a very beautiful pot. It's nice and light. I'm placing it there. This here is a pot I made the other day. You can hear it sounds quite woody. It's nice and dry. Now, there's an art to resolving your rim. You do not want to use a wet sponge for this because the water runs into your crack, causes huge amounts of hydrous expansion which cracks your pot very 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 dangerous so you take your sponge and you squeeze the water out there must be no fluid water in your sponge it must just be damp and any water transfer is more of a capillary action an osmosis of high concentration to low concentration than actual live water in your sponge. So I'm really drying the sponge out here and I'm moving over the rim in the direction of the rim. I'm not going straight line. I'm sensitive to the form of the pot. I'm curbing my force my force is following the rim and you can see the sponge is only affected in a line because as I curve I am obeying the will of the bowl. That is an absolutely critical thing as a potter. You obey the clay. Otherwise you will be terribly upset about the fact that your pots are not working. And a telltale sign is there's a little drop that's run there. That 
is a telltale sign of too much water on your sponge. So I even had slightly too much water on the sponge, despite the fact that I had really wrung it out. That rim is now incredibly pleasing because it's been worked as a whole. In one motion, I've gone halfway around the pot, turned halfway around, turned halfway around, turned halfway around. The same tool had an action on the whole area as a whole, and that's a very important thing. This bowl could go for firing, or one could apply an underglaze I recommend cobalt blue underglaze or radiant red because those colors work very well contrasting with the white of the porcelain. I've worked this room as a whole. It's completely integrated. A good tea bowl should have somewhat of a landscape, somewhat of a skyline. One could easily take this bowl and take a sheet of sandpaper and have a perfectly level room. But that is not what we want. Not in this instance. In this instance, we wish for a bowl that fits so beautifully and so naturally in the palms of one's hands. It's been formed by hands for hands. So, if one chooses to decorate the pot at this stage, it's nice and supple and moist, and there's nothing more wonderful than how glazes react with glass. Here we have some glass beads, and different color beads give you different effects. A blue bead will fire blue, a black bead will often fire brown or purple. A green bead usually maintains its color, a white bead can go clear. And you gently work it in, you place your fingernail there, and you extract the quill. Pick up your bead, you position it, you gently work it into the surface, place your fingernail and extract the quill. You should not allow your beads to be less than double the radius of the neighboring bead. So one would never apply two beads right next to each other. You would give them a generous spacing to allow for the clay to experience a state of bliss. If they are too close, as the clay shrinks, it feels a little bit cramped. And that's when you have cracks forming. Something like that. Four blue beads. It's beautiful, it's simple, it's striking. They will actually give you runs, depending on what temperature you fire them to. A bead at 1000 degrees will do very little. A bead at 1100 degrees will form a little halo, but at 1260 degrees absolutely volatizes and it gaseates and it will form a halo as well as a bit of a dribble. Very, very beautiful. Glass beads are very, very wonderful. However, I did get frustrated by the fact that there are only a certain number of kinds of glass beads. So I then started manufacturing glass rods. 
where I can control what kind of chemicals are going into the glass. And I had a lot of fun. I even made glass tubular rods. This is a cigarette holder. Oh, gosh, not much nicotine in this cigarette. In fact, you can't even see the cigarette. Here I have a selection of glass rods and the beauty of this is you pierce the surface straight through to the other side and you see how long you need it to be and you place your rod It's just absolutely wonderful in terms of the control. You can put a thick rod in, that's a nice thick one. I'm choosing not to though. These thin needle-like ones are absolutely exquisite for this part. These will fire, they'll settle down, they'll fuse to the surface of the glaze and they'll modify the glaze. I've got a tiny bit of copper and a tiny bit of gold in these rods and that will give so much interest. So when one is drinking one's tea, there are flow lines and lines of contact where the glass has fused into the glaze. And it really, I mean, it's just such a, such a fantastic kind of, it's sculptural, it's, it's fun, it's, So that will now be ready for firing and off it goes to the, uh, to the kiln. After it's been fired, this is an example of how the rods are flowing into the glaze. There was a lot of tin in these rods and they've clouded and formed these beautiful plumes. As you're drinking from your vessel, it's like you are gazing into the sky. The other amazing thing that happens is you can see how they dilute the glaze and cause tonality in the surface of the glaze and you can see the intense crazing where the glass has modified the glaze in the immediate vicinity and caused micro facets and micro shattering of the glaze surface due to the disproportionate contraction of the glaze on the surface of the porcelain. We've now worked with the plastic clay, the malleable clay. Now we're moving through to working with firm, hard surfaces. These are plaster of Paris molds. And one can carve plaster of Paris quite easily and incredibly elegantly. Josiah Wedgwood's pottery is all based on sprig molds of car carved plaster. This is porcelain, casting slip, and we simply pour. And here we are making a pendant. It's a beautiful piece of jewelry. Place it like so. Pouring the casting slip, you want a clean, steady flow. You want it to go in and radiate out. And you're not wanting there to be a pause in your pouring. That will give you a, a hesitation line. And hesitation lines, classically, we avoid. There are some ways which they are beautiful. <laughs> 